Good morning. I'm Sandy Gomp. We're going to talk about bone infections today, and I'm going to try and lecture a little bit loosely off of my uh, slides so you guys can ask questions. Some of you have heard this talk before, but fear not, repetition is good for you. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, you can break down osteomyelitis into categories. It makes it uh, easier to remember and helps you figure out what to do with them. The first one is hematogenous osteomyelitis. Uh, it usually occurs in the long bones, thank you, and is treated with intravenous uh, antibiotics, or excuse me, is uh, also uh, IV drug users uh, uh, may get hematogenous osteo and uh, you can also have discitis or vertebral osteomyelitis uh, of hematogenous or origin. Uh, you also can have contiguous focus osteomyelitis uh, from the outside going in, uh, usually related to either trauma in the setting of no vascular disease uh, or uh, in the setting of vascular disease related to ischemia and tissue breakdown. And also, there's chronic osteomyelitis, and usually that involves necrotic bone. We'll talk about that a little bit further. The key features to be aware of in bone infections is that you, they occur in areas of avascular bone. And certainly any area where you've had preceding trauma, any fracture with scar uh, or inflammation, arthritis, mostly just devascularized bone. Uh, bone, as you know, doesn't have a whole lot of good vasculature to begin with. Uh, areas of thrombosis or ischemia, again. Usually uh, you require prolonged antibiotics to get uh, bone infections under control, and they usually require debridement of that uh, the dead bone and avascular areas. Hematogenous osteo is commonest in children. Uh, the, in, in, all, in adults, it usually is in those areas of abnormal bone. Transient bacteremia usually will inoculate the bone, and then from there it will spread either locally or through the Volkmann and Haversian canals if you go back to your Anatomy 101. And you can develop uh, septic joints. Uh, periosteal lifting, which is usually seen in children because their periosteum is, isn't stuck down as it is in uh, adults. Uh, sinus tracts may appear as uh, a late uh, effect, and you can also see metaphyseal edema and abscesses uh, in the metaphysis, like uh, as an abrodes abscess. So here's a uh, couple schematics of the anatomy, and you'll see um, the little end arteries. Ah, thank you very much. Sorry, technical malfunction here. Uh, little uh, end arteries uh, where you have um, sluggish flow. Uh, the bone marrow obviously is where you have the most uh, vascularity, and then there and there's a growth plate uh, with osteoclastic activity. Uh, usually, the infections in adults, in particular, don't cross that that area. And he in hematogenous osteo, again there's that avascular growth plate and you don't usually get uh, infected joints related to hemato hematogenous osteo unless it's um, uh, we, unless you have an unusual attachment of the ligaments and it's able to cross the tissue planes there. Uh, septic arthritis most commonly will occur at the elbow with the proximal radius. Uh, at the shoulder and uh, in the humeral head and in the femoral head and the hip. In infants, you of most often see Staphylococcus aureus, particularly now with community-acquired MRSA. Uh, you can also see group B strep or E. coli. Uh, in uh, young children to teens, usually, it, again, it's going to be Staphylococcus aureus, sometimes group A strep, and in adults, it's usually Staphylococcus aureus. These are some plain films. Uh, you may not be able to see these very well, but this little lucency uh, at the metaphysis. Uh, 
of a long bone is uh, at Brody's abscess. In this infant, the femoral head, this lucency, is another uh, abscess. Again, hematogenous osteo. Uh, this is a bit of an unusual case where you have infection in the long in the long bone in the marrow, and this is not the case that I saw, but I did see a gentleman in private practice who had. Uh, he was initially we were consulted for bacteremia with staphylo MRSA staphylococcus aureus, and he presented. He also they were also working him up for a lymphoproliferative disorder, uh, um, lymphoma because he had these infiltrates in the bone marrow. But once we started treating him uh, for the MRSA, all of that disappeared. He had humeral. Um, uh, infiltration, femoral, uh, long bone infiltration. He also had infiltration of the zy zygomatic arch, and that all resolved. Special cases to remember uh, when you see osteomyelitis or a hot, tender sternoclavicular joint, a sacroiliac joint, um, those are uh, tip offs to IV drug abuse. Uh, or in the presence of septic arthritis, hematogenous arthritis. Ver vertebral osteomyelitis, uh, again, is hematogenous. And in drug users, uh, always remember the possibility of pseudomonas. Most of the time, again, it's still going to be staph aureus, uh, gram negatives. Fungi can occur in intravenous drug users as well. And this is another plain film with some um, sclerosis of the sacroiliac joint, a little bit of separation of the joint on an MRI, on a CT scan. And these are just more images of the same type of thing going on. Other special cases of hematogenous osteo are prosthetic joints, which we don't uh, ordinarily think of as a hematogenous osteo, but it is uh, for the most part. Uh, it's not quite as common, but you can get surgical site uh, contamination or introduction of the infection at the time of surgery. More often, it's a transient bacteremia that uh, occurs later on. And uh, patients will, if it's early, if the infection occurs early on, you're going to see it probably within the month. Uh, after that, it usually is related to maybe a UTI or a dental procedure or some transient bacteremia. The average lifespan of a prosthetic joint is about seven or eight years. Uh, so if you see any loosening or pain in a prosthetic joint before that, uh, you have to worry about uh, osteomyelitis. And what usually is done is the joint is aspirated and a gram stain and culture is performed. If that's positive, then really for cure, the hardware has to come out. And this is just a plain film again. And you see some lucencies along the hardware that shouldn't be there. Uh, the surgical management of prosthetic joints ideally uh, is what's called the longer way procedure, uh, essentially a two-step procedure where the hardware is removed, aggressive uh, debridement is performed until you see pink bleeding bone. That's followed by six weeks of intravenous antibiotics and then three months of oral antibiotics tailored all to the cultures. And then at, uh, at that time, the joint is re-aspirated. The space is re-aspirated. If the if it's negative, the cultures are negative. Then the joint, a new joint, is implanted, and the success rate with that is usually on the order of 90 90 percent. There's always with any uh, osteomyelitis, there's always a risk of future recurrence because you you even if it looks like you have clean margins on the pathology, there could be some infected bone left behind. Uh, the other way, uh, less ideal, but sometimes is required because the patient can't tolerate being without a joint for all that long, especially elderly patients, very elderly patients with comorbidities. The hardware is removed, the IND is done, the, a new joint is reimplanted at the same time, and then you do the, the prolonged antibiotics.
success is about 60 to 70 percent. But if you have a, an 80 year old who otherwise you know is not very mobile, that might be a, the way to go. Vertebral osteomyelitis occurs in the um, in children and teens or the elderly uh, individuals over 50. Uh, it is uh, usually comes either from the arterial side or um, the Batson's venous plexus from below uh, related to UTIs. Usually occurs in the lumbar area followed by thoracic and cervical. You don't see very much uh, primary cervical uh, discitis. Uh, lumbar, of course, you expect more abnormal bone, more arthritis, more um, pressure. Uh, going on there. Again, Staph aureus, but don't forget gram negatives and strep species. Usually uh, it presents with an insidious onset of back pain over several weeks, gets worse and worse and worse with a lot of paraspinal spasm, low-grade temperatures, and on examination when you percuss down the spine there will be percussion tenderness of the involved vertebra. It's usually treated with at least 6 weeks to 12 weeks of IV antibiotics. And of course if there is an abscess, that uh, paraspinal abscess that needs to be drained and usually that's done by interventional radiology nowadays. It used to be neurosurgery or somebody, somebody get involved, but they usually will defer to interventional radiology and they do a pretty good job. So it's just a schematic of, of the uh, supply. Uh, there's arterial supply from the aorta, um, uh, the dorsal and ventral branches that penetrate into the disc and there's also the external venous supply and remember, although the blood is supposed to be going away from the bone, it's, it's all very sluggish and um, travels up and down uh, in the venous plexus. So there's a lot of turbulence in there, and it's a good place for, for bacteria to, to set up infection. This is uh, the initial site of infection usually occurs at the end of the disc, um, at the end of the, the, the body. Uh, in the disc and spreads from there, usually anteriorly. And of course the more it spreads the more destruction you have. You can have adjacent destruction of uh, vertebral bodies and the entire disc uh, liquefies into pus and you can see that uh, on an MRI where you'll develop uh, an epidural abscess. And this is a plain film. On this plain film you see that you have nice pre preserved spaces and very clear margins of the vertebral bodies except for this this uh, disc space. It's lost. It's uh, You've got very blurred and distinct margins and that's an area of discitis. Same thing on this MRI, very obvious destruction of the uh, disc space with some abscess. Okay, any questions about vertebral osteo, hematogenous osteo, how to manage that? Not really, pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, it, the question is uh, how, uh, how long do you wait before starting antibiotics before, um, you know, before getting a diagnosis? Do you get a diagnosis first? Do you wait to start antibiotics? Um, it depends on how sick the patient is. If the patient is febrile, acutely ill, they have an abscess, um, it, you, it, it, we'll just usually start them on IV antibiotics and then drain them. Uh, it, it, ideally, yes, you would like to have a pure culture uh, to base your subsequent antibiotics on, but um, most of the time once the patients come into the hospital, they're sick enough that they require IV treatment, and uh, some of them are, are actively bacteremic, so that makes the decision for you.
primary option that's offered at times, and then uh, the yield tends to be less than optimal. Um, and oftentimes, neurosurgery or orthopedics tends to be more reluctant about doing open procedures to make these diagnoses. So unfortunately, it seems like far often, more often than not, we're treating empirically. Yeah, I would say that's, that's the usual case where by the time the by the time the possibility of a biopsy or is considered, then uh, the patient's already been on antibiotics. The question is, uh, are, are that since it is hematogenous in origin, do we look for other sources of infection? And yes, uh, that's an excellent point. Um, you have to make sure, especially if it is staph aureus, that there isn't an endovascular source of infection uh, or a focus elsewhere that needs to be drained. So um, in the setting of bacteremia, certainly you would do an echocardiogram, sometimes even without the setting of bacteremia, and you would want to check. Um, you also want to look, look for abscesses elsewhere. Very good. Any other? So the question is, what if you already know that there's an MRSA or, or a Staph aureus bacteremia and then later pick up a, a focus in the vertebral spine? Um, do we need to do a biopsy at that time? I would say um, it, most likely the, the patient's going to be on antibiotics by then. And regardless, the likelihood of uh, the staph being involved in that infection is very high. Uh, you again you would be looking for other sources since you already went looking in the back uh, you would look for other other um, endocarditis and other sources of bacteremia and I, I think I would feel fairly comfortable if the patient came in with bacteremia if that was the source very good questions Thanks. Okay. Well, let's move on. Um, we'll talk about contiguous osteomyelitis, basically osteo that occurs from direct inoculation through skin. Uh, usually contiguous osteo will manifest uh, within the month after a penetra penetrating injury, uh, after bone surgery, or uh, related to an adjacent infection. Um, I will say if it's uh, uh, after bone surgery uh, within a month, that I would that's more likely to be a Staph aureus uh, or more aggressive pathogen. But you can see less aggressive uh, pathogens like coag-negative Staphylococcus cause infections later on uh, from direct inoculation. That's not unusual. Uh, usually, um, you, in the setting of trauma, it involves the tibia and fibula. Uh, with fractures, open fractures, uh, open reduction, internal fixations, prosthetic joints. Uh, other uh, sites are decubiti. We see a lot of stage 4 decubiti in our spinal cord injury unit, infected decubitus ulcers. And usually, as you would expect, uh, that is uh, polymicrobial in nature. A lot of staph aureus involved, but also um, group A strep, a lot of gram negatives and anaerobes. Staphylococcus uh, epidermidis and other coag negative staphs. Um, you can, uh, there, the, the extent of contiguous osteo may be either superficial, where you only involve the, the, oste the, the superficial um, uh, membranes, and, or it can go deeper to involve the cortex, the subcortical bone, or the entire bone. And when we uh, treat contiguous osteomyelitis, when we discuss it with the patient, we, I usually, dis, uh, I usually um, talk about it in terms of remission rather than cure because there is a, always a, a likelihood in the future uh, or a certain percentage in the future that uh, uh, recurrence may occur, and that may be years down the line. 
contiguous osteo may be vascular disease associated, and that's where we see the patients with diabetic feet, um, peripheral vascular disease, people with vasculitis, or radiation therapy where there's blood, ves blood vessel damage. Usually with diabetics or, or people with neuropathic uh, uh, feet, uh, it starts up with minor trauma uh, and abnormal pressure points and the tissue just breaks down uh, and pen eventually it uh, reaches the bone. Again, polymicrobial and you should not uh, forget the possibility of anaerobes in these infections. Unique factors to diabetes are the presence of hyperglycemia, which affects local immunity, uh, as well as flow and um, uh, bacterial growth. Uh, they have a relative immune deficiency, and they often have associated hypothyroidism, which also affects immune function. And uh, that's all on top of the, atheros the microvascular atherosclerosis that they get, which affects uh, the penetration of antibiotics. For uh, pressure decubiti, the sacral decubiti, uh, the, a useful test that you can do is a technetium bone scan. It has an over 99% uh, negative predictive value, so a negative bone scan in that setting uh, usually indicates a uh, lack of osteomyelitis. So uh, now and then we'll do those in the spinal cord injury patients. Uh, you often, uh, on bone scan, uh, will have some abnormalities detected related to heterotopic bone, even changes related to pressure can cause abnormal scans, so it's hard to rule out osteomyelitis if they're positive, or, or rule out or rule in osteomyelitis if they're positive. Biopsy cultures are not necessarily diagnostic, uh, they may be helpful. Uh, but be aware that when you do a, a biopsy, you're not really doing it in a, sick, a sterile area. You may get bacterial uh, contamination from the surface, not necessarily involved in the bone. So you often use a combination of findings uh, with the bone scans, MRIs, uh, what you're, you're seeing clinically to determine uh, whether there's osteo present. And these are some plain films and bone scan images of vascular contiguous osteo diabetic foot infections. In this hallux you see basically the, the first joint entirely destroyed. Same, same thing with this film. On this uh, bone scan, excuse me, you see a uh, hot spot basically. It's just a darkened area of inflammation. This, uh, moving along a little bit, is trauma-related osteomyelitis, and we see that this not infrequently where you will have a sinus tract right there. This just sort of pops up and starts to drain, and that, you know, that's not normal. shouldn't uh, have anything pop up and start to drain pus uh, consistently, and this is what's underlying that little sinus tract. You've got uh, plain film with, um, if I could get this to shine, oh, well the defect is large enough that I can just point at it, right? <laughs> that's a, you've got bone that's eaten away. It's a bone scan, again, obviously the infected area is, is, high, is uh, hot. This is what they've done to manage this infection. And if you notice, uh, there's a lot of uh, white material, and those are antibiotic impregnated beads. The lesion has been entirely debrided and saucerized, essentially, uh, and filled with antibiotic impregnated beads to hopefully treat the infection locally, and also to fill dead space. Thank you. Um, you also notice these bars and what those are doing is immobilizing the joint so that healing can actually occur. So those are some of the, the things that are required to get healing to occur in these infections. We'll talk about it a little bit more.
Um, this is chronic os osteomyelitis, and chronic osteomyelitis is defined essentially as organisms cultured in the presence of dead bone. You may have sinus tract. You already have compromised, scarred avascular tissue. And it's maybe a relapse of treated osteomyelitis. Uh, we see a lot of uh, patients who have motorcycle injuries, for example, uh, with open fractures in Tampa General. And uh, this is the, the type of infection that they get. It may just be one organism, but it's often polymicrobial. And no matter what, debridement is going to be required to treat the infection. Um, let's talk a little bit about imaging studies um, and what they mean. For plain films, you can expect findings to appear uh, consistent with osteo within 10 to 21 days. So it's a little bit of a lag, about 30%, at least 30% of the bone density has to be lost for a plain film to be positive. Uh, the specificity is about the same as bone, span, bone scan. Uh, in children, you'll see periosteal lifting, but you don't necessarily see that in adults, so don't expect that. You'll see cortical destruction, and you can see marrow lucencies. Nuclear imaging, uh, there's not really a standardized uh, best uh, modality for imaging bone. But at least as far as technetium uh, three-phase bone scan, it's fairly sensitive. It's not very specific. Again, you can have abnormalities from heterotopic bone and pressure and other, uh, other causes. Uh, it is, a, again, in three phases. You get an angiogram phase, a blood pool phase, and then three hours delayed up uptake, uptake image. And that's where you'll get uh, intense uptake in the setting of a bone infection. White cell scans um, are relatively insensitive. They take uh, about 24 hours. Uh, there is a technetium uh, 99 white cell scan, which is shorter. Uh, basically, they label neutrophils, and they are 98% sensitive for acute infection. But anything longer than two weeks to a month, uh, your sensitivity really starts to go down. You get some false positives with Charcot and Charcot deformities and pressure, uh, the presence of cellulitis. Um, if you're looking imaging through the abdomen, you're going to have obscuration of bone. And gallium scans really uh, light up monocytes and macrophages uh, in the reticular endothelial system. You'll, you're more likely, if you have uh, an infection going on for more than two weeks to a month, a gallium scan may be more helpful. And they are preferred in vertebral osteo. And what we often do is we'll combine more than one modality. We may not see uh, anything specific on one uh, test, so we'll order another one and just try and uh, take the sum of, of the results to make a decision. MRI is considered the gold standard. Um, on T2 weighted imaging, you'll see marrow edema, uh, subperiosteal collections, and dead bone. But again, um, MRI is not always uh, uh, the most cost-effective option in many settings. Now, we're coming up on the tail end of the talk, so let's um, talk a little bit about what your orthopedic surgeon is thinking about when it comes to osteomyelitis. And you should be aware of the Kearney Mater staging system for osteomyelitis. And it, help, it, it puts together the extent of disease and the condition of the host. Um, especially as uh, it relates to suitability for surgery or preparedness for surgery. So the first part is staging the actual disease, the degree of ne necrosis. You have one through four, which is medullary involvement, superficial, localized, and diffuse involvement, and then the host staging. A, good immunity, good blood flow, young patient. B, compromised immunity. Or, or flow, and then uh, C, the morbidity of therapy is probably going to be worse than the disease itself. So here's the, the disease staging, and in one, when you're looking at, let's say this is a CT scan of the bone, uh, 
uh, in cross section, you have medullary involvement, and as you might expect, stage one osteo is hematogenous osteo. Uh, stage th two through four is contiguous osteomyelitis, where you have infection uh, penetrating from the outside in. Um, obviously, through and through infection is stage four. Again, some different ways to look at that. Host factors that affect the treatment. Um, local factors that are important is the set setting of chronic lymphedema uh, and venous stasis. You get a lot of uh, static fluid pressures that make it very difficult for antibiotics to penetrate the area, make it diffi difficult for um, uh, healing growth factors to get in and affect the immune uh, function. Uh, you have large and small vessel disease, arteritis, scarring, uh, those all affect uh, um, the healing, the possibility of healing. The biggest one that you'll hear your orthopedic surgeon harp on uh, every time they come and see the patient is tobacco. They, if a patient smokes through their course of therapy, debridement, and intravenous antibiotics, it really uh, affects how well they're going to heal and how well they're going to resolve. Nutrition needs to be optimized. Uh, immune function, if possible, needs to be op optimized. Blood, uh, blood sugar control needs to be optimized uh, in order for any surgery to proceed with the greatest success. So management of each stage for stage one, uh, hematogenous osteo, you just treat with antibiotics for the most part. If there is a localized abscess, then you uh, may need to unroof it to let it uh, heal, or to, uh, you may need to actually do intramedullary reaming to drain the infection. For superficial osteomyelitis, it only involves a cortex. Uh, if it's very early, if it's just uh, osteitis, you can treat with antibiotics. Uh, if it's later, then it'll require superficial debridement and possibly coverage, flap coverage or uh, skin grafting. If, uh, of course, the deeper it is, the more uh, uh, bony involvement, the more aggressive debridement needs to be. And then you get into the issue of dead space management. You'll hear this term dead space management. And what's that? Well, basically you have an open area of bone and that needs to be covered because otherwise you're not going to get blood flow to the area. It's not going to heal. Um, it doesn't epithelialize the way uh, other, the soft tissue would. So you need to cover it. Uh, also, the more uh, debridement, the larger the defect, uh, the more unstable the bone is going to be. And that also affects healing. So you have to fi figure out a way to stabilize the bone if necessary. And a lot of times that might involve uh, external fixators. You've seen those where there's a little, uh, there's some pins above and below the area and uh, bars that are holding the the bone straight or, or stiff to stabilize it. And there you also have uh, bone grafting that may need to occur. Chips of bone are harvested from the iliac crest, for example. Uh, you may need some temporary placement of antibiotic impregnated beads. For joints, sometimes they'll put in an, uh, an antibiotic impregnated spacer uh, to help uh, improve the local uh, treatment of the area. For diffuse osteomyelitis, uh, or at that point we're generally talking about uh, possible amputation with through and through infection. But there are a lot of uh, interesting techniques where they may completely excise that section of the bone and then uh, essentially squeeze it together with a, an external device and then slowly uh, with screw, well the little screw type of device, slowly pull it apart and let the, the bone uh, grow in to fill in the space and slowly lengthen the bone that way. So there's a lot of things that you can do surgically. So basically, again, dead space. The dead space management uh, is required to maintain function and uh, provide blood supply. Uh, you want to replace any you want replace uh, any vascular. Uh, you want to cover the the bone with vascularized tissue, and uh, 
allow for some form of primary closure. Muscle flaps, free flaps, um, and that sort of thing are often required the more uh, extensive the infection is. That's just another uh, visual of some forms of grafts. These are just some an, where there's open areas of bone with some little bone chips that are filled in. Uh, temporary closure over antibiotic beads. The beads are later removed and then filled in with bone graft and covered up again. Usually that's over a co course of two or three weeks. <laughs>